a six part series. This is part four. And um, it is hosted by the Embora Grazing Partnership. Um, as you just heard, this event is being recorded and it will be posted online for uh, general public access after this event has concluded. Um, since 2020, the Champaign County Soil and Water Conservation District, the Land Connection, the U of I Extension, Terra Alosa LLC, the Illinois Soybean Association, and the Pasture Project have partnered to provide education and resources to increase regenerative grazing practices in and near the Ember River watershed in Illinois. We have hosted field days, online training sessions, and online informal discussions with grazers, farmers, landowners, educators, and stakeholders about the benefits of regenerative grazing and look forward to hosting more events and sharing resources into the future. Um, you can find more information about the Embora Grazing Partnership and our events and resources on the Champaign County Soil and Water Conservation District's website. And um, Aaron is gonna share that in the chat with everybody. Um, we are so happy to have you all here. I am Mallory Krieger with Terra Alosa LLC, and I will be facilitating today's session. I'd like to thank the members of the Embora Grazing Partnership for organizing this series. We have Jennifer Jones of Illinois Soybean Association, um, Aaron Gundy and Morgan Cobble, and Ivan Dozier of Champaign County Soil and Water Conservation District. Jesse Schaefer of the Land Connection, Nicole Haverback of the University of Illinois Extension, Katie Bell of University of Illinois Extension, and Kelsey Virgin of the Pasture Project. This series is funded in part by North Central Sarah's Professional Development Program, and we'd like to thank them greatly for supporting this work in the Amber River watershed. Uh, as I said, today is part four, focusing on animal health and parasites. We are joined today by Teresa Steckler, Beef Commercial Agriculture Educator with University of Illinois Extension, and a producer of various meat goat breeds, including savannas, boars, and Spanish goats. Teresa is going to share her knowledge and experiences associated with grazing and discuss our topic of herd health and parasites in a presentation, followed by a moderated question and answer session. As we progress through today's talk, Teresa wants to encourage everybody to ask questions. Um, we want this to be as participatory as we can make it. And so if you have a question during the presentation, feel free to use the, the raise your hand feature and we will call on you. Um, Teresa will call on you to, to get your question answered. You can also, if you prefer, to um, type the questions into the chat feature and we will ask them on your behalf. Um, and at the end of the presentation, we're gonna have time for a general discussion. So if you've got kind of deeper or more individualized questions that you'd like to get answered, that'll be a great time to do that as well. With that, I will let Teresa introduce herself and get things started. All right, thank you, Mallory. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, as she said, I run a very loose talk, so anytime that you feel that you have a question or you need clarification, raise your hand. Um, if I don't see it, I'm sure one of the girls will let me know that, hey, there's a question for me. So basically, I uh, have a master's and a PhD in reproductive physiology. I worked at the University of Michigan on my postdoc where I was in charge of the the sheep flock. Yes, there is a sheep flock at the University of Michigan. Um, and we did prenatal programming and other research using those animals, but I was the primary uh, researcher in charge, uh, oversee Doug, who was in charge of the farm. So I guess I was the liaison from faculty to the farm since I had the animal science background. From there, I worked at the University of Southern Arkansas, um, work with livestock producers, sheep, cattle, goats. Yeah, it ran the gamut down there, then was recruited back to Illinois and have been with Extension for 14 and a half years. And during that time, I also had a 50 nanny uh, goat production, meat goat. Uh, I haven't, I don't want to do anything with uh, milk production too much time. Um, my goals were to improve kid performance. So you, you maximize growth rate, but had really good muscling on those kids. So I started out with boar, then started crossing with Kiko. Didn't really like that cross very well. You 
had some Spanish nannies. The Spanish savannah across was really nice as far as kid production. And also um, wanted to bring back the parasite resistance as we'll talk about um, because of the facilities that I were in, I had to manage parasites a lot differently than most people would. So, and I, you know, there's always that huge learning curve. And if you're not in to, if you haven't really raised livestock and you're trying to just get your feet wet, start with very few numbers, get some experience, work up slowly with the herd numbers. So that's a little bit of my background. And we're just going to go ahead and get started with the talk. Um, all right, so um, let's see. Good. we're going to get started with the parasite management. There are many things that everybody needs to understand when it comes to parasite management. And one of the big things is, um, you know, how do you, you hang on just bear with me one second here I wanted to try to get some of this down and out of my way so I can see my slides perfect um so how do you know the if you have a problem if you've been with like work with livestock for many years you you will see the normal signs and the clinical signs uh are that are consistent whether you have sheep goats uh it doesn't matter cattle um, diarrhea, weight loss. Um, they don't want to move around much because they just are physically tired. They don't have the energy. Uh, pale mucous membranes, um, peripheral edema, bottle jaw, as it's shown in this picture with this uh, young goat. So uh, poor rate of gain. Coccidia in young kids can result in kids that never seem to grow, and it, it's a problem. So do you have death loss? Do you know what that death loss is from? Um, if you're not sure, you probably should have at least one animal posted, and then you'll, un you'll know what the cause was and how, if there's a pot, you know, what you need to do to ameliorate the situation. This is coccidia in a small land or a small sheep, goat, whatever it is. Pretty, pretty ugly looking. Um, no hair on it. It has just really gone downhill to the point, you know, it's got a bloated belly. May have a little bit of a bottle jaw. I can't tell for sure, but um, it is just a very unthrifty looking animal. Ears down, just sad to say, looking animal. So what, what's the big deal about these parasites? Well, one of the worst ones, especially for the small ruminants, is what's called the Hamachis contortus. And this picture in the top left shows you how many parasites can be in one droplet of water. That's what they, the, the uh, animals can in, consume if you don't manage your pastures very well. Um, and the one on the left, you, you'll see a little bit of a bottle jaw forming underneath her chin there, and that means she's starting to have parasites. Then you look at the eyelids, they become pale uh, mucous membranes, and then you look over there at the goat at the bottom uh, left, and you see, look at the, the hair on her, so you see her hips. She's not grazing, actively grazing with the rest of the herd. Looks like she's got a little bit of a poopy tail on her. Um, just uh, a very unthrifty. That hair coat is rag looking as well. That you know, poor goat should have a nice sheen to their coat, and that one just is a very poor doer. So what does this all mean? It's going to cost you money ultimately. Money in time, money in treatment, the antihelmintics, money in loss production. So trying to mitigate those is the best thing before it ever becomes an issue. So again, not every parasite's created equal. Just because you have an infestation does not mean you're gonna have a disease. Uh, like if you have tapeworms, I don't get excited about tapeworms. Yes, do they look nasty? Yeah, but they're not going to affect production like if you have coccidia or if you have, uh, uh, Hamachis contortus. 
And again, that old wise saying, an ounce of prevention is very, is really worth a pound of cure because that could make, make or break you financially uh, if your kids don't perform and gain very well or your, or your calves. I'm going to default to kids because that's what's on my brain, but this talk is uh, will work for cattle as well. Um, if you have specific livestock questions, let me know. So what of our what can we do? We need to know our enemies. That is what parasites are out there. What are our weaknesses? Um, a lot of the anti-helminthics, anti regardless of species, are becoming resistant, or the parasites are becoming resistant to the anti-helminthics. That is a huge weakness. And we need to make sure we understand how that weakness arose and what can we do to mitigate that weakness. What are our strengths? Our biggest strength is having enough pasture and knowing what our stocking rate should be without overgrazing and grazing our pastures too low because it does multiple things. Besides having less productive forages, you also set up for a continued parasite infestation because they're just continuously eating the, paras the, the, the parasites in that droplet of water. So therefore, we need to have proper management going on in our farms and understand, it, you know, if you don't, if you, if you're not sure, call on somebody in extension. We will give you an unbiased assessment and make recommendations. The, and realize that, you know, just because we make a recommendation, it doesn't always work on every farm. But we can probably work with you and try to find something else as well. So. Factors that influence parasitism on our farm. Temperature plays a huge part. Wintertime, hey, we don't have a problem with parasites and it's perfect. Humidity, boy, does it get humid in Illinois. Therefore, that's why Hamachus contortus can rear its ugly head and just be a royal pain in the summertime. Age of our animal. For coccidia, it really affects the, the young whether it be a goat, whether it be a calf. So, you you know, in, in um, uh, calf feed, we use rumensin. That will take care of it um, and keep it at bay. Seasonality and pregnancy status. So, yes, pregnancy progesterone will result in a decrease in immune function in our livestock. So that allows those parasites to actually sort of take hold and overwhelm the animal. So strategic planning of when you want to uh, introduce antihelmetics to a pregnant, pregnant animal is very important. Pasture management, I already alluded to the fact you really have got to either do a good rotation so that your pastures have at least 30 days, if not 35 days rest, or you need to uh, set up something like a dry lot system. Um, Antihelmintic resistance, I've already mentioned that, and there are differences amongst the dewormers. Just because it is labeled for one thing does not mean that it will work on something else. You really got to know what those labels mean and how to work them. And we're probably, we're not going to get too much into the dewormers in this one. That's a talk for a future day. Common problems. Anybody see what's going on here? We have way too many animals up in this one little area. And the thing you got to remember is what's your true stocking number versus what you actually have out there. So uh, where I had my goats, I only had three acres. I had 55 does, way, way, way too many. So we ended up creating a dry lot situation to mitigate our parasites. Uh, feed. Where are you feeding these animals? It's really good to have these goats sticking their head through the, the fence because they're not less apt to get parasites uh, because where they're uh, dropping their feces isn't right there where they're eating. So the how are you feeding these animals? Are they constantly getting their feet in the uh, feeders? Are the feeders dirty? Um, Let's, what else am I trying to think of here? Um, is it on the ground? Are you feeding directly on the ground? Because that can make a huge difference in what kind of parasites our livestock can pick up. So what are our enemies? These are the major ones. This is not to say that these, this is all inclusive. 
but these are the primary ones that we have issues with uh, in Illinois. So we have the Hamachus contortus, also known as the barber pole worm. Um, Coccidia, uh, mentioned that nematodes are the round worms, uh, the tapeworms or the cestodes, I don't get excited about. The trematodes, yes, you can, because that could be like liver flukes and some other things that can cause problems if you don't uh, worm periodically. Um, this is for, especially for uh, sheep and goats, Hamachus contortus, uh, anemia, bottle jaw, and it will cause death in a fairly short order, depending on the amount of parasites in there. They thrive in the warm, humid conditions. And of course, Southern Illinois or Illinois does not have warm, humid conditions at all. Um, the larvae live on the short grasses. Early to mid morning is when you want to turn the goats out because that gra that humidity has actually burnt off because of the sun and those parasites have actually or the larvae have gone back down to the bottom of the plants. So that's keep keep that in mind if you don't have a lot of pasture, but if you uh, keep the goats from going out when there is dew on the grass. Um, the parasites can dry out, but they will survive until moist conditions return, and they can survive for a long time. Um, I don't remember the exact time, but it is basically they can survive all summer long to come back and wreak havoc later. Um, 10,000 adults can kill a sheep or goat, so keep that number in mind. Um, and this is a picture of what the Hamachus contortus look like. If you could see those little red squiggly lines in there, that is actually the Hamachus contortus. Um, and here is a nice close up for everybody. This is what they look like, and they actually will latch on to the lining of the intest or the alimentary canal and just start sucking the life out of the animal because they th they live off the blood of the animal. So this is what the Hamachus contortus looks like. Um, sort of looks like a little baby eel with, uh, I don't know, or lamprey. That's what I'm trying to think of, a lamprey that latches on the fish. Basically the same concept. Lampreys will literally suck the blood out of a fish and that's what the Hamachus contortus does. On the left hand, or excuse me, the right hand side, that's what the egg actually looks like. And again, that female can lay thousands upon thousands of eggs and just keep the, the vicious cycle going in your pasture. Somewhere along the line, you have to break the cycle. Um, and this is just the life cycle of the Hamachus contortus. As you can see here, you have the adults in the abomasum or the intestines and they lay the eggs. The eggs will develop and then we have, it gets down into the grass and it just develops into a larvae. The larvae eventually will come up and the goat or sheep or livestock will reconsume a new larvae, which will pupate into an adult and start the whole cycle all over again. So what do we need to do? We need to figure out ways to break this cycle whether it's if you treat the animal with an anti or you let your grass grow so that the, the larvae doesn't have an opportunity to be eaten by the, your livestock. So other enemies, coccidia, and there are different forms of coccidia and they are generally host specific. Uh, diarrhea, usually bloody. If you've ever smelled uh, an animal with coccidia, it has a very distinct nasty smell and you will never, you, from then on, you will know when your animals have coccidia. I mean, it's just very evident. Yes, you can have animals that have coccidia and not manifest these symptoms, but generally that's in your adults that have already developed an immunity to the coccidia. Um, the, uh, as it says there, a high percentage of the young are affected, and that's because they have not developed an immunity to the coccidia. And that you can have a large number will, uh, death loss, and you can have rapid death loss. The thing about coccidia you need to remember is if you don't treat in a timely fashion, 
the the coccidia invades the small intestine so the small intestine is unable to absorb nutrients so if you go back to your basic physiology the the vitamins and minerals and everything that gets absorbed by the small intestine is vital for life function in animals and if they can't absorb the required nutrients those animals are stunted and they're permanently stunted and they will never grow and I've had them on my farm, didn't know I had coccidia, never smelled it, didn't have an issue. And I still would, you know, every year have one or two that was affected uh, by coccidia. So generally speaking, it affects the, the kids that are three weeks to five months. Um, very sporadic in older animals. Again, the older animals generally have a uh, immune immunity to it. Calves are susceptible to coccidia. Uh, generally speaking, when calves start nibbling around, you have guys generally feed a coccidia stat in the feed or rumensin. Um, in sheep and goats, we, we can put it in the water as in the form of corid, and that works very well. So I usually, when my first kid got at two weeks of age, I, oh, I put cord in everything. It was uh, all water, whether it was for the kids or the adults. Um, I just wanted to nip it in the bud and I kept it in there till um, all the kids were at least two months, three months of age. And all the waters were uh, cleaned out every week to make sure that um, they were fresh and that all the animals would drink the coccidia stat. So other common parasites, lungworm. Um, I've had posted one animal that was full of lungworm and lungworm are nasty things. It's just, that, that was one that even made me, uh, you know, I found it rather disgusting. Uh, so it can damage the lungs um, and it will cause the bacterial pneumonia. The animals just become very unthrifty. Um, the adults live in the lungs, um, coughed up, swallowed and hatched out. So um, they develop and grow and migrate back to the lung via the lymph. So it's a really nasty situation, treatable, but nasty. This is what lungworms can look like. Basically, what happens is in in cattle, the lungs are not very big proportionate to the body, and they become like a lunger is what we call them, and they just don't do very well. They can't keep up with the rest of the herd because there's so much damage done to the lungs. So it, it's... Um, not a nice thing to have happen, but, and I haven't really seen a lot of it, but it can't, you know, the, it is present there. This is the one that is really, in my mind, the most disgusting. It's a little uh, bot that fly, goes up in the nose and you have these animals that continuously snort and sneeze and try to get these out and they just invade the, um, uh, what's it called, where the, the, the canal up in the no nose, I can't think of what it's called. They Sinus cavity, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Katie. Yeah, the sinus cavity gets in, filled up. And uh, if you can imagine anything up in your sinus cavity moving around and how annoying that could be, just imagine if you had three or four of those bots up there. So the animal behavior it becomes really different. And yeah, it's disgusting. So lice and flies are common amongst, well, humans get lice as well. Cattle get lice, uh, they're, they're species specific most of the time. Um, very easy to treat with a, a topical, uh, topical um, anti-helmintic. Um, usually uh, ivermectin will work with that. The uh, other thing that I have found, I do not like to use straw for bedding. The straw has like tubes and that is the perfect place for lice to be and live and you think you get one animal treated and you get another one that breaks out with lice and it just be unless you treat the the the, the bedding and everything which can be a, a, a problematic depending on your setup um just try to use something for bedding that's not straw if you can you if you get away with it not have a problem perfect i mean there's a lot of cattlemen that 
use straw for bedding and they just treat every spring uh, with a pour on delicer or delouser and works fine. Um, small ruminants though, um, sometimes the lice just overwhelms the small, small ruminants. Flies, if an animal, uh, if you uh, castrate and it's a springtime and you don't put something on there to uh, keep the flies off, the flies can lay eggs and the maggots can take effect or if animal gets poked by something and has an abscess that ruptures or festers, um, yeah, flies can lay maggots. The the nice thing about maggots, and there is such a thing, the, the maggots will clean up the dead tissue, but at the same time, you got to make sure that you get that, that area cleaned up and put something on there and, and make sure it doesn't get out of control. So here is what people don't really think about. And I didn't really think about it till after I saw this, but this is pasture larvae in numbers. And you can see that in March, we're going to have some pasture larvae. And I'm looking at the solid black line and climatically normal years. And that's gonna go, you're gonna have some, and then you're gonna see it wane down. And then when you hit June, July, when we hit those typical hotter, hum more humid days, you're going to see a ramp up in those parasites. So one of the things that you wanna consider with your beef cattle is, when do you really wanna treat those beef cows? Do you wanna treat them before you turn them out and then it, uh, bring them back in to treat them again? Or do you want to wait when the numbers start peaking, say late June, uh, or excuse me, mid-June, early July? It's one of those things you, you, from a um, management perspective, you need to keep an eye on your animals and, and work them when it works well for you, when you have shoot availability, that kind of thing. Then if you uh, look at the dashed line or the, I don't know, the next line down that says dry summers, uh, wet fall line. Um, the dry summers are a boon for us, but hard on our pastures. Uh, boon in the fact that you're not gonna see a lot of parasite but the problem there is um, it's uh, low humidity, high temperatures, but we don't have a lot of grass growth. So what happens to your pastures? You tend to get the pastures overgrazed. Then when you're, the rains come back, those parasites are ready to resurface and your livestock are out there eating grasses that are a little too short uh, and you start to potentially get a uh, parasite infestation in your livestock. So keep in mind that you, you need to weigh out, should I leave my livestock out there to eat the grass down to nubs, like what's happened in Southern Illinois the last few years because we just didn't have the rainfall or bring them up to a dry lot and feed them hay. Well, you only have so much hay and you've got to weigh out how much hay you need versus you, the number of animals you have and what kind of weather you think you're going to have. Right now in North America, our hay stocks are less than what they, I think it's the number I saw was 20% less than normal for this time of year. So um, there are a lot of guys that last year that started, had, that started to feed hay in June, or excuse me, in July, August in Southern Illinois. Yeah. So they don't how... have a lot of extra yeah. hay. Yeah. Hello? Oh, accidental. You're oh, all good. Oh. Okay. <laughs> um, so one of the things you, uh, with livestock producers is you can find some hay, mean, doesn't necessarily have to be the best hay. Um, as I tell a lot of guys, a snowball is better, or hay, uh, crappy hay is better than a snowball. So you can always supplement that hay to make up for nutrients, but you, they, the cattle will need that gut fill. Um, 
then if you move on to the very bottom line where you have a dry summer and you don't really have a wet fall, but it's more of a dry fall, then you don't see as many parasites. So, you know, you have to understand how parasites grow, what they need to survive and work within your limitations of your farm and your what animals you have so that you can mitigate these parasites. It can be done. It's sort of a, it, 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 it can drain you at times to um, do it correctly to, so that you don't have to use a lot of uh, antihelminthics, but in the long run, it, it will be worth it. Um, so poor management. Yes, we overgraze our pastures a lot of times. The important thing is, is to keep their heads up. Poor nutrition leads to a reduced immune function and the pet and the animals cannot fight the parasite without their without energy so we've got to set our animals up so that they have a fighting chance to overcome these parasites um i i'm a big one especially in the goats i'm sorry there's several breeds that have been ruined by the show jocks one of them being the boar the boar was brought over because of its parasite resistance and if you think about where boar came from, they came from Africa in dry, humid cl or dry climate. Now, you can't be dry and humid at the same time. Um, and they were actually climbing into trees. They don't weren't designed for grazing, and we're forcing them to be grazers. We need to change how we think about these goats, so we're not se setting the, especially the uh, uh, boar goats, up for disaster. Um, Yes, uh, there are a lot of breeds that are, or have been, in my opinion, run by people that are just making the quick dollar and they have bred the parasite resistance out of them. And those are more prone to getting them. And if you have a girl and I've, I'm brutal, I'm brutal when it comes to this, but I developed a herd that was very, I didn't get parasite, they, they would have a parasite load, but they weren't uh, overwhelmed by it. Keep in mind, that's an important point that I need to make. You, every animal is going to have parasites. You will ha never have a parasite-free animal. And um, you don't want to strive to have a parasite-free animal. You need those that are not um, resistant to the antihelmintics so that they can be the ones to propagate. And those are the ones that you can control when they seem to get out of control as far as numbers are concerned. And yes, we haven't been start smart dewormers. We've had veterinarians, we've had people, Dr. Google is the worst thing that could ever have been because you get on websites and people do this, that, and the other, and there is no rhyme or reason for what they do. They think it works. And what they've done is created a uh, false uh, sense of security and we need to be judicious in how we use wormers. We don't worm on a regular basis. We don't worm uh, because we think they need it. We worm because they do truly need the dewormer. So what are our strengths? We have knowledge. We have the research behind us, deworming programs. We have the antihelmintics, and we have some novel antihelmintics. Um, excuse me, I didn't mean to go through the uh, too quickly, but I, I, we need to we need uh, to implement everything to have a pro, uh, a very good active and um, what's the word I'm looking for? Not active program, but a a. Uh, uh, good worming program to keep the, the parasites at bay. So one of the things that we can do is we can do a fecal egg count and we can uh, know that generally speaking in the springtime, if they have 500 uh, per gram of feces, 500 eggs per gram of feces, generally we treat. In the fall, if it's 200, 200 eggs per gram, we treat. That's a generality. Um, so some animals can actually withstand 500 per gram. 
some animals cannot tolerate 100 per gram. So knowing your animals is a key, uh, a key to it as well. So one of the things I teach is how to do fecal egg counts using the McMaster technique. Um, and you use a flotation um, and then you use what's called, uh, um, yeah, you, there's multiple mediums. Sodium chloride, actually I like to use um, uh, Epsom salts. They are much better. Um, you can go to the veterinarian and buy the, the different ones. That, but um, I hate the sugar one because everything gets so sticky after you get done and it just never seems to go away. But this is what's called the McMaster slide. It actually has the grooves on it uh, or the lanes so you can actually do a true count. Um, and you do the program and it's but you, then you can do a calculation and it gets you the number of eggs per gram. Very simple procedure, you just have a microscope. The thing you have to do is be uh, cognizant of the fact that you have to do it the same every time. If you're not doing it the same every time, then you, know, you can't really compare from previous counts. Um, then the other thing that I teach is the FAMACHA. And I don't remember what FAMACHA stands for, but basically you look at the eye color in these animals, the, the mucous membrane around it, and that will tell you um, if that animal is, probably has an infection or has parasites. It's not a, a, a guarantee that it's Hamachus contortus, but it's a, one of the tools that we have to say, okay, this animal's anemic. So why is she anemic? Is it because she has parasites or is it because she has something else going on? And this is just an inner, a picture showing you how pale the membranes can be um, versus a, one that looks bright red. Um, just a simple test to do. So what are, is our ammunition, our deworming programs? However, deworming is the worst way to control parasites, but it is necessary for us to use. So there are multiple strategies. We do not do the every three weeks besides it's time, you know, besides the money and time when we're not really utilizing the, the animal's host defenses to uh, mitigate these parasites. And eventually leads to resistance, um, that needs to be revised to say it does lead to resistance in most herds. Different strategies, you can rotate your wormers. Um, we really don't recommend that as much. We would prefer that you stick with one dewormer now and until it's no longer effective. Um, oh, there it is, no longer recommended. Because it, it, the problem is you can develop resistance to multiple dewormers at the same time. And there you go. What are you left with when you really have to treat your animals? Um, strategic deworming. That's what I highly recommend. Immediately prior or after parturition, as I mentioned, progesterone uh, reduces our the, the host immunity in females, so it makes her more susceptible to the parasites. And if you uh, worm at that period, that time period, that'll help her out. Um, but be careful. One of the things you've got to be aware of is whether or not that wormer will go into the milk and whether or not that milk will be safe for the whatever's uh, sucking on that teat. So, um, there are certain warmers you do or do not want to use depending on when you give it either before or after parturition. Um, again, do not deworm and then move into a clean pasture because guess what? You're just going to infect your pasture. You hold them 12 to 24 hours. That is best, if you, especially if you've got a dry lot area. Um, you can time, de time your deworming. And then what I like to do is actually uh, for my goats that can tank up on hay, I like to hold them off feed for at least 16 
to 24 hours. Why? Because that gets some of that hay out of the rumen area and that gets that, uh, that uh, anti-helminthic in there where it can actually get to those parasites and treat the, touch the parasites and do what it needs to do. You have an exceptionally full rumen, um, like you just fed the animals and then you go out to treat, not a good strategy at all. So you can limit feed for an additional 12 hours, um, either turn out on the clean pasture or you can deworm again. Um, I generally did not deworm twice. I just dewormed once for what we did on our farm. Um, you can deworm with multiple classes of dewormers at the same time, but you better talk to somebody because there are certain classes of dewormers that don't mix well together. So be careful in that regard. The other thing is you could actually um, lead to more resistance than you want by doing that. So we have the novel anti-helminthics and I don't, it, the tannins are great. There's a lot of things in the world that has tannins. Um, I used to go get oak leaves from the towns to feed to the goats. They, they saw it as a treat. Um, you can plant Ceresia lespedeza. However, keep in mind for uh, cattle, Ceresia lespedeza will get woody after they eat it once or twice, and then they won't touch it again. The Ceresia does very well with sheep and goats, but it's also one of those that once you get it planted, it will take over if you do not manage that very well. Uh, chicory, I love chicory. The goats love it. Um, cattle will eat chicory. That's not necessarily their favorite. Uh, bird's foot trefoil, uh, the cattle will eat it better. Um, my goats just didn't really like the bird's foot trefoil. But, you know, every animal is different, just like we have different uh, taste buds as well. So we need to manage our pastures. The best thing is, is not overstock or overgraze. We need to manage the species that we're putting in there. You can do co-grazing. Um, one of the things that I, I, if you're gonna have like goats or sheep only, if you bring in donkeys or something, or if you have horses that co-graze with them, they actually are indeterminate hosts for the parasites. They actually will work great for each other. So whatever horse parasites there are, the goats pick up, uh, is a uh, that the hope the parasite stops there and vice versa for the um, the uh, donkey um, the herd we need to manage your herd how are you, what are you doing as far as keeping the parasites out um, what is your budget you know with the cost of everything now you just can't go and spend a lot of money on anti helminthics you probably can't spend a lot of extra time to treat these animals because you have other things that are more pressing. So if you can manage your pastures, that will be very helpful on your budget and your animals as well. So this is, we're getting close to the end, but one of the things you wanna keep in mind is that our cattles prefer to graze. Our sheep like the forbs. Our goats love to browse. And what are we trying to do? We're trying to turn the goats and sheep into cattle where they just eat grass. And we need to recognize the behaviors of these animals and, and what can we do to mitigate the parasites, but yet provide the sheep and goats and cattle with the nutrients that they need from our pastures. And this is just one example for our goats. They prefer to eat with their heads up. And so how do we manage our herd? Um, if you see that, you know, we want them to look very nice and healthy. We've got the, the bucks there, the bucks in a single pin and a dry lot pin versus a, a Kiko there that he's in a nice pasture. Look at that, that grass is more than six inches tall. You don't have to worry about him picking up parasites there. Then you get the scraggly thing that somewhere along the line has picked up some kind of parasite and is looking very poor. And then you have that poor goat that, ha that again also is looking poor. Um, and if you look at the pasture, 
that's underneath it or by its feet, it's not a very tall pasture at all. So it's just setting itself up for failure there. So what are you in it for? Are you in it for pets or are you in it to make money? Um, you need to decide one, what kind of animals you want, two, what are your ultimate management goals out of these animals? So are you raising them for meat? Or are you raising them for to sell for the, the show stock? Or what why what are what's your ultimate goals with this? And do you intend to make money? Um, but if you're not intending to make money, don't run it for the rest of us by your poor management. Um, and I'll, in my opinion, the show jocks have ruined it for a lot of people because they have not made judicious decisions in the animals that they're breeding. And a lot of the animals, especially with the boar or goats, have become, uh, they're no longer parasite resistant. And that's all I have for everyone. So we have about, you know, 12 minutes or so, 13 minutes, whatever it is for questions from the everybody. Great. Well, we do have a couple of questions in the queue. And if anybody has more questions, um, feel free to type them into the chat or raise your hand and we'll call on you to ask them live. So the first question in the queue is, um, how long should the pasture be left alone um, or grass left alone or grass? Sorry, I'm going to try this again. How long should the pasture be left alone slash grass should grow to eliminate worms? And you covered that a little bit, but could you talk a little bit more about kind of in this region, kind of typical durations of rest between grazings? Right. Yeah. Um, bare minimum is like 31, 32 days. I really try to tell guys, hey, depending on the number of paddocks you have, if you can go 40 days, you are assured that that hamachus contortus is not going to be there. Now, having said that, you also need to take into consideration what is the weather like. So in the springtime, when you have really fast, lush, lush pastures, you can rotate more quickly to keep that grass from getting out of control. In the summertime, when the, the, the grass starts growing less, then you want to slow that down because uh, paras the grass isn't growing back as quickly and the parasite has a, a more readily, uh, a bigger chance or a better chance of being picked up. So that's when you want to try to stretch that time period out so that you're, you're minimum of 32 days before you, you come back to that pasture or that right. paddock, I should say. Thanks. And then um, the next question, um, referring to your recommendation to not use straw as a bedding, are there specific types of bedding you would recommend instead of straw to prevent lice? And do you have a preferred option? When I was, when I still had my goats, the thing that I did, there was a farm, uh, I'm trying to think of the town. It was, uh, North of Marion outside of Benton. I can't think of the name, but the gentleman, uh, mixed dry shavings and rice hulls. And that made for excellent bedding. It was easy to clean. Um, and it broke down very well because we would, we had a uh, hundred acres of, uh, row crops next to us. So we would always start at the far end and bring it slowly back. And we would just, you know, clean out the, the kidding pins and things of that nature. And it, it made for a very nice bedding. And then be, uh, before that, we are underneath all of that, we had about a foot of lime that we put down. So what happened is if there was any uh, wetness, it would go to, you know, uh, urine that didn't get picked up. It would go down to the lime. Then we would clean out between each uh, kidding what was wet and nasty and then we would put fresh in and we did not have a uh lice problem the the, the years that we used uh straw we used year, straw for two years i think and each year we had lice and i said no i i paid extra um 
for them to come and we just filled up the whole barn and had extra where we could uh we had a, a stall a big stall or bin I guess if you want to call it where we had the leftover so that we have some extra to uh, clean out the kidding pins that's what I loved and the, and it wasn't shavings it was more of a it's and it wasn't a dusty dusty I don't know how to explain it but it was it was like um uh, uh it just it, it was a very good well mix you had some dust but there was, the shavings weren't huge I guess uh, if I had to say they were about the size of dimes if that makes sense it wasn't like this uh cedar shavings that you go buy at some one of the stores that you can put in that are like half dollar size thanks um are there any questions from the audience that anyone would like to ask Feel free to just go ahead and unmute yourself and ask if you have a question. One question I had, Teresa, was about the um, dewormers and their effects on dung beetles, because I know, especially with grazers, there's a hesitation to use dewormers because of their effects. So the, the, the one thing you need to keep in mind is, yes, there are certain dewormers that will have an effect on the dung beetles, and that's generally your ivermectin class. And so the um, mycotils, I believe, if I got the right name, but, um, uh, starts with the C. I'm trying to come up with the one that we use in the cattle, um, the, the wormer that's the blue one does not kill the dung beetles. It'll come to me in a moment. <laughs> I'm forgetting the name of it. Um, not Corid, uh, Cydectin. Cydectin will not kill uh, the dung beetles. So any of your ivermectins, yes. Uh, and that that's one of the things that um, has been brought to the attention. A lot of guys have, you know, other than maybe using it in the springtime for like parasites, because the cydectin um, is not as effective on like the, the um, mites uh, and, and lice. So we'll typically use a poron ivermectin for that and then use a cydectin later on in the year when the dung beetles are more active. Very good question. I forgot about that. Any other questions? Well, I have one. Um, okay, so organic producers, could you speak a little bit about um, how, what options organic producers might have for controlling parasites? The, the best uh, thing that they have going for them are the tannins. Um, and there's some research that would suggest that certain forms of vinegar are very good at uh, putting it in the water. There was some research being conducted over in Mizzou, and um, the the research never finished. Um, the, the, the researcher ended up leaving before it concluded. However, there was some really intriguing data to suggest that it worked. Um, I could try to see if anyone else has done that research. I'm not aware of it off the top of my head. And... Um, the, the one thing, uh, somebody asked about the diatomaceous earth. The one thing that I will say about diatomaceous earth, I have not seen any data to substantiate that it is effective. Um, there is some really cool data out there on uh, putting fungi out in your pastures, but recognize that fungi will actually um, latch onto the parasites. It, it, it lives in the, the, the dung. So the parasites don't have an opportunity to grow and, and, and uh, the larvae don't have an opportunity to grow and mature. Um, but you got that's only going to be a temporary fix because the fungi are going to require a, a moist uh, temperature. So if we have a dry, you know, drier season and then they, what they require to grow, that won't be very effective. But that that product was available. I don't know if it's still available and I don't remember the name of it. Those would be the two options or three options. But if you can um, 
how bring in tannins be careful um you know you can go get leaf litter from you know people in town but make sure that it's just like the leaves they can consume the leaves and uh, oak leaves have a lot of tannins in them um the again we brought the chicory the bird's foot tree foil the uh surgis lespediza it there are people that just bail lespediza only so there's a way to maybe bolus um your anti you know your tannins in there for an anti-parasitic effect other questions until we have a question, one of the things that you can do to mitigate parasites, and I guess another option for the, 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 the uh, people that don't want to use uh, dewormers is you could actually have what's called a dry lot. And the dry lot has no grass growing in it so that there, the, there's no opportunity for the parasites to be picked up but you can still let them out into your paddocks where your pasture is, but you limit, let, they are out there for a very limited amount of time. So they still get to fresh grass, but they just do not have an opportunity to sit there and eat the grass in, in specific areas where the, where the parasites will be. Because remember, if a goat has parasites, all Anywhere that they defecate is where the, and where those eggs are or, or where they defecate, those eggs are going to be present in, in that grass after a period of time. The larvae are going to mature and then climb up that grass. So you want to try to minimize their exposure to where they would have uh, a short grass and where they defecate. That makes sense. We have time for, for one more question. Does anybody else have any anything they'd like to ask? Okay, well, with that, I would like to extend a big thank you to Teresa. We really appreciate your time and your expertise. I personally found this talk to be really fascinating. It's one that I don't see very much in... Um, discussed in detail in the grazing world. And I found, I personally found it really helpful. So um, thank you everyone for joining us today. We will post this webinar recording to our YouTube playlist soon, uh, which you can access by visiting the Ember Grazing Projects website on Champaign County Soil and Con Water Conservation District's webpage. Our next session, the fifth in this six-part series, will be held Tuesday, March 14th, and it will be held with Brett Matthews of Dividing Ridge Farm in Liberty, Illinois. The session will be a little bit different than what we've done so far in this season, in this um, series. We will be working through troubleshooting scenarios with, um, with Brett, who is a grazer, and he's going to be helping us kind of walk through how he troubleshoots issues on his farm. So uh, please do see our website for the list of our upcoming sessions and to register for those as well. If you already registered, you'll receive an email reminder for that date. And I'd also like to put a big plug in for an upcoming winter field day that we're gonna be hosting. Uh, it's going to be a two-day workshop. You could pick one or both days to attend. It's held March 7th through 8th in Hillsboro, Illinois at uh, Bernie Hands Farm. And it is on winter grazing topics um, in regenerative grazing. So we're going to be talking things about herd health in winter, winter forage options, and how to handle the mud and the pugging and the freezing and thawing. So um, we do highly encourage everybody to come out to those field days, um, March 7th and 8th, and information is available on the EGP's website. The link is in the chat. And with that, thank you everyone for joining us today, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.